Namaste and welcome to Satsang. When defining what is meant by ego on this path, Guruji has frequently distinguished between ego and egotistical behavior. When ego no longer exists, is it possible to have egotistical behavior? In other words, does ego relate to egotistical in some way? Ego should relate to egotistical only when one defines themselves as the body form in the transient world and has that sense of separation. When that falls, there shouldn't be any type of an egotistical thing in place. It just will be the natural flow and outcome of situations at hand. Okay, so I just keep it short at that. Um, of course, there will be a lot of judgments on actions. If something is done which you don't agree with, you'll see it as egotistical. <laughs> you know, so what can be said on that? I guess egotistical as many times in the eyes of the beholder from your point of view as to what it is and what it's not. Okay. I, I spend a lot of time in front of a computer how would be the best way to put the practices into place when using a, a computer and use this time for making progress? How do you, Guruji, use the computer? Do you multitask, for instance? Try not to do any multitasking, you know, doing more one thing at a time. And uh, when you're using computer, again, uh, take a break every now and then. Just look up. And just be in the moment, take a breath, do the balanced breath as much as possible. And trying to keep your focus steady in one direction rather than being scattered. You know, one thing at a time to the best of your ability without being scattered. Okay. Is it important to spend time in nature? Is being in nature necessary to make progress in a spiritual path? Well, spending time in nature, many times you're more in the moment than caught up in some, some other thing that you've got to be doing. So it's important to have time of relaxation and to just again, own that I am, own that I am. You know, it's very effective when being done in nature. So I would say that nature, being time in nature, is a pretty important part of the path. Of course, you don't have to go out in the woods to spend time in nature. You could actually just go to where there's a park bench, or even if you're sitting there looking up at the sky or a tree. Uh, at that point, you can be in nature if your attention is not on all the other hubbub that's going around. So one can also always find time for nature. It's all around you every day. So I don't think that there's anyone that can't find some time for nature. Okay. What is the wheel of karma? Why is karma referred to as a wheel? What drives the wheel? Okay. The wheel of karma are the actions that come back uh, on you as a point of from actions you've done in the past. You're going to re reap other actions that are going to happen in the future. You're going to reap different events that happen in the future. Okay, if you steal something, the karmic reaction is you're going to go to jail. Okay, that's what happens. You know, if you do something foolish, I mean, you're going to reap the, the reactions and the karma of that. Uh, nobody gets out of anything. The universe will bring something back in a way to show you a lesson on you either get it or you don't, and you'll continue to develop the same types of patterns. Karmic patterns and wheels keep spinning, and the same drama and patterns keep playing out, you know, until eventually you get it. So what drives the wheel? The mind. Your conditioning. The knee-jerk reactions. The actions that you do, that's what drives the wheel. That's what keeps it in motion. Okay? All of the uh, grasping at something or the pushing away, rejection of something, again, there is no uh, surrender into that moment. One is attempting to control it in some way or a manner, and that again keeps the wheel in motion. Okay? 
In the story of Adam and Eve, in which the snake tricks them into eating the fruit of knowledge, what does the snake signify or symbolize? Okay, you're going to hope that I say kundalini, but it's not that. <laughs> Basically, you know, it's one can say it's the egoic thing making itself known, and, uh, you know, this mind starts to go in, and this, this starts to arise and says, oh, but wouldn't you like to do that instead, you know? And, oh, knowledge is a perfect thing. And then there is that choice where they want to go after knowledge, the knowledge of good versus evil. All they knew was good. And so they chose to also know evil. Okay? They wanted to have knowledge. They wanted knowledge of duality. Okay? So what is it? Well, one could say it's part of the snaky mind that's arising, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the, the part of ego that starts to make its presence known. Okay. I came across this quote, when a student takes one sincere step towards the Satguru, the Satguru takes nine steps towards the Sadhaka in their progress. Is this true? If one sees that the student is sincere, and they're actually surrendered, and they're going according to what's being given? Yes, of course. You're going to give everything that you can to aid that student. But when you see that this student is very resistant, you know, and is playing head games and saying they want this, but their actions are showing something totally different, then of course you're not going to be as involved in it. They have a right to they want to follow their foolishness to follow their foolishness. So you give them that opportunity to stand or fall. Let them find out, you know, that's all. So yes, it's true. If the student takes those steps and is sincere and is genuinely, you know, trying to surrender and genuinely going forward on their paths, then yes, of course, the Sadhguru will continue to try to give as much direction and guidance as is possible. Sometimes mind can be very busy during sleep, a lot more so than in waking state. Is Kundalini clearing house as I sleep, or is there another explanation? Well, it can be a lot of things, you know, the things of the day, or things that have been on the mind for last week or last month, or something that's pressing. You can also have other things that are very vivid. Um, you can have uh, past life types of things that come up. All, all sorts of manner of things can arise in dream states. It's not just one classification that one can put on it. So um, a busy mind during sleep, um, it, in some things it can be clearing, and uh, it doesn't stop, Kundalini doesn't stop bringing stuff up to be seen. Uh, you may get to the point where you're conscious of sleeping is sleeping. You know, you may be conscious of, of breathing, snoring, whatever, and, and quite surprise yourself that you're asleep and yet aware of it as it's happening. Okay? So, uh, don't be surprised at what happens during sleep. A lot of things will arise, and uh, it just is continuing the journey, that's all. As has been related through various texts and via your website, it seems as though some have blown out and entered into realization after sitting alone or in contemplation for some time. Jesus went into the wilderness. Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. Guruji sat on the banks of the Ganges. Does Guruji ever instruct Sadhakas to go sit until the final blowout happens? At times I feel a strong wish to be able to do just that. No, I, I don't, unless somebody is really towards the very end of the journey. Or if I see that they're just so caught up in mind that they're better just to go sit. And then I will say at that point, just go sit and, you know, stare out at a point of the water and just let things go by, whatever. But uh, I, I don't advise people just to go and off on their own and decide this is what I want to do, therefore I'm going to abdicate all my responsibilities and I'm just going to go hang somewhere. I don't advocate that. 
You know, I don't advocate irresponsibility on this path. Not at all. So it depends on what context you're asking this. If you're looking at it because you just want to abdicate your responsibilities and just go hang somewhere, then the answer to that is no. Okay? If you're in a position of uh, you don't have the responsibilities and it, you're getting far enough along the journey that there's very little left to go, then I might say yes. Everybody's different. There is no one blanket answer that can be given. As in many questions that are asked, it would depend on where the sadhaka is at. You can't give a one blanket answer that will fit every situation. Okay? What is the difference between someone getting counseling from Guruji while not being on the path and getting instruction and guidance when one is uh, in and on the path? Because when the counseling is given, it's given for specific things that usually have to do with transient life situations. Uh, when it's given on the path, it's there to break through ego, and, and that's it. You know, it's... Uh, done in a little bit different vein is much more hammered home to change external situations when it's the counseling, okay, versus more general on the spiritual path, which is to cut through the roots of ego, where I'm giving you direction where you can cut through the roots of ego more than being nailed and hammered from the outside to change an externalized uh, transient pattern. Okay. Why are people often afraid to talk with Guruji directly? Uh, very simply, they don't want to hear the answers. Because <laughs> they know if, I, if they ask me, they're going to perhaps hear the thing they don't want to hear. So it's much easier to talk to a sadhaka where they can take the words with a grain of salt. Well, what do they know? It's their opinion, whatever, you know. When they hear it from here, they know that I mean it, that that's it. And uh, no BS, I'm going to give you what I see and uh, what is needed at the time. And many people don't want to have that. They want to have their ego assuaged and they want to be patted on the head and they want to hear some flowery response. Usually when I step in, it's to just cut through something that I see that needs to be cut through. So that's why many times they don't want to talk to me directly. That's... <laughs> I've heard Guruji speak of a thing called cellular memory. Could she please explain what this is? Uh, the body holds many memories and it's called cellular memory. Okay. Sometimes when working on people and you work on certain areas of the body, so they will have memories that come back that release, and that's part of what happens with that. Okay. These things can be released anyway on their own with Kundalini. If you go through the Kundalini, um, just sometimes when I'm working with people, it releases things much quicker. Uh, but uh, I don't do that so much anymore because people were abdicating and they weren't doing their practices. They said, all I have to do is lay down, have Guruji work on me, and everything gets done for me. So I don't do it anymore. That's it. Okay? People abused it, so now it's no longer being offered. So um, that's what happened with that. So good luck with that. Now you have to do it the long way. <laughs> Without wanting in any way to be disrespectful, I'd like to ask you about the meaning of celebrating birthdays and mainly the Guru's birthday as it seems such a paradox. Well, Guru's birthdays are celebrated because if they didn't come into manifestation, you wouldn't be having this offering of the path being given to you. Okay? Is that an easy enough explanation as to why Guru's birthdays are honored? Because if that form hadn't come into being to carry that consciousness, you wouldn't be able to speak with me now. Okay? And you'd be on your own. End of mystery. So that's why it's honored. It's, uh, it's just respect that the guru has come into existence, came into a form, 
took the time to go through the path and uh, spent the rest of their time in form to offer this to others. So you don't have to do it so much hard on your own. And especially when the guru happens to be the head of a path that's brought something new into, you know, is the head of a spiritual path and has brought in lots of new techniques and new dynamics in order to aid humanity, then even more so, that's to be respected. Why do they, uh, why do they celebrate Buddha's birth? Okay, why do they do that? Just to honor what he's given to the world. To honor that he took that time. He sat. He went through all the hardship in order to bring what enlightenment and what he can to break through the conditionings of mankind. Okay. How is the guru devotee relationship supposed to work without falling into dualistic mindset? This body here helps, serves, supports, loves, surrenders to that body over there, yet at the same time is not self serving, either nowhere to go, nothing to get, the self is one. I think people have such a confusion about you're already that. Okay, If you were already that and you knew that without it being a, another ideology, you wouldn't be here. Okay, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be on this path now. The fact is you're in confusion. The only one that knows truly that they are that is the realized being. That's it. Otherwise, you don't know. It's a conjecture. It's a hope. Just like you don't know that God exists. You hope that God exists. You may have an idea that God exists. Do you know what God is? No. Not until that's experienced. Not until all that's fallen away. So when you're in the transient, you, you work with things in the transient level. There's respect for what's given. Okay? That's all. That's all. So you're already in a dualistic mindset. Okay? How do you do it without falling into a dualistic mindset? If you weren't in a dualistic mindset, you wouldn't be here. And when you are out of the dualistic mindset, there, there is nothing there. There is no struggle with it. There is no second guessing it of how do I make this relationship work because there's no relationship to make work. <laughs> okay? That only comes out of the mind duality. So the one asking this question is in duality. Okay? So, you know, let's get out of the I'm already that mode. Uh, you know, everybody has the potential for realization because at the core of being is only that one kernel of life. The same as in all beings. But until you know that and the rest of the mind and the shell is broke open, okay, you can't see it. It's that, that clear, okay? Is the love one feels toward the guru in any way different than the love for other in any other relationship? Well, it should be. I hope, to, I hope it's different, you know, because, uh, you know, this is the problem. People get confused and they start having sexual feelings or this other drama, you know, and, and all of these jealousies and all of this other drama arises. And for what? For what? You know, then you're holding guru to be some form that you're trying to be attracted to or trying to have, you know, this other relationship with. And while on the transient level, yes, there is a sense of this transient relationship, also understand there is something deeper there. That the guru should not be in the mind of relationship. They are never in that mindset of looking for, uh, I want this relationship or that relationship. You know, that's not going to happen. The guru is not there looking for friends and pals and buddies. That's not going to happen. It's a totally different mindset than what people are projecting out there. 
And if the guru is looking towards sexual stuff, then they are not a guru. They're not in realization. They are not beyond that. Then they're still caught up in form and body. They're still caught up in the realm of duality. They're still on the wheel of karma. And you should run the other direction. Okay? That's all. That's all. So thank you for your satsang questions. I hope that they've answered some of your questions. And please keep sending them in. Namaste. Welcome. Have a great day. Bye.